Well, how about that worship team? They don't just leave worship. They can move the whole stage around. We'll give it up for our worship team. <laughs> So uh, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different than uh, just a traditional message sermon time. And uh, we have been going through a series of teachings over the last eight weeks to take a, a break for Easter. So I guess over nine weeks, but done eight, eight messages on emotionally healthy spirituality and talking about the intersection between our emotions and our, our spiritual walk and how that can affect our lives in um, significant ways, both for the good or for the negative. And so we've talked about things like um, overcoming anger, if that's a struggle for you, anxiety, how Jesus had his own emotions. We had a powerful gathering centered around dealing with the grief in, in our past and in and, and another week on moving backward to go forward. And all of those uh, messages and everything um, are available online for video on YouTube, or you can listen on our podcast. So um, if, if there's any of those that stand out to you, it's like, that would be helpful for me, would definitely encourage that. But for today, what we wanted to be able to do is allow you to ask any of the questions that you may have around having an emotionally healthy spirituality. And so this is hopefully high risk, high reward. Uh, that's what that's what we are definitely hoping for. But um, you can text in your questions uh, by going using the QR code code or going to r for Rochester Calvary dot org slash ehs. Either way, will will take you there. And not only uh, can you just text in questions, but you also can throughout the service upvote any questions that you're like, oh yeah, this really resonates with me. I'd love for uh, Pastor Bob to weigh in on that. So I'll, be, I'll operate more as the moderator. I'll chime in sometimes and have you uh, be the one in the hot seat. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an honor and a privilege, privilege isn't it? <laughs> it feels exactly like yeah, that. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so if there's ever been like, man, I wish I could ask Pastor Bob this, uh, I guess, you know, within the, it's, it's a broad range on the EHS. We just ask that you uh, keep your profanities to yourself, I guess, in the <laughs> chat room. I guess that's our primary rule. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do want to start with this is... Uh, why have this conversation on emotionally healthy spirituality? What, what, what prompted this? Why, why is it helpful and important for us to be having this conversation? Yeah, I, I think especially in spirituality, it's easy to, to focus on the things that we should be doing or shouldn't be doing. And yet our life doesn't seem to grow. And so the, the focus on emotionally healthy spirituality is, is learning how to love well loving God and loving others. Because when our relationships are, are struggling or fractured, we just don't navigate that well. And so there's a lot of wisdom in God's word that uh, is a lot further beyond just uh, a command of something you should or shouldn't do and uh, how to actually build relationships that, that go the distance. That's great. And uh, our, our staff did submit uh, some questions. So yeah, again, you can upvote those or, or share those. But there are a few already in the queue uh, there that you guys can interact with. Uh, and yeah, like I said, upvote and, and things of that. But um, I'm wondering, Pastor, um, what do you do if you're somebody who is, uh, you feel like you've got some emotional struggles and you're seeing it affect your spiritual life? Like, what, what do we do if, if we're in that spot and in that place? Yeah, I, I think the tendency in church world is to deny that because we want to look good to other people. I mean, consistently, uh, people on Sunday morning are very well behaved, <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. But the idea is, is that we, we tend to think that if I acknowledge areas that I'm struggling with, then people will think less of me, and that can get us into a lot of trouble. So I think owning what our struggles are. Uh, we do wrestle with anger. We do wrestle with grief. We do wrestle with anxiety, all of those things and more. And so I think having real conversations about them is how we find our way forward. Agreed. Now, what work is doable by ourselves uh, when, when dealing with this whole conversation? And when is it necessary and helpful to get a counselor involved? How, how do we know where that threshold line is for ourselves? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure there's a, a, a single 
uh, answer to that. I think that uh, if we are struggling, so here's my general rule about this. If I keep recycling and going over and over something and I'm not able to find my way out of it or forward, and uh, I just feel stuck in it. Sometimes the conversation with someone else who can ask a better question than I've thought of is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I do encourage um, uh, that option. It has benefited me multiple times, and, and I know people it's helped a lot. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the same thing. Like whenever I feel like I'm getting stuck and I just like, it keeps swirling in my head yeah. and maybe I've even talked with some friends or somebody else and it's just like, it's not going anywhere, but it's still consuming my mind. Like that's my cue. I need to talk to right. somebody who, um, yeah, can ask me different questions. And I, there's, there's still so much unnecessary stigma around talking to a counselor. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make any logical sense to me, but I understand it is a cultural thing. Um, but I know both you and I have talked openly about how helpful our counselors have been for us oh, yeah. in different seasons sure. for different issues. And um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's helpful. I had one person come up to me. They were very surprised that I had a counselor, a therapist, and they asked why. And I just said, if I get unhealthy, the, the kinds of repercussions of that are pretty significant in my personal life and then in ministry world as well. So uh, for me, it's been a very helpful tool. Awesome. Now, what boundaries should we set up in our life if emotionally unhealthy people are surrounding us? Like, <laughs> and I guess I'd take it even further to clarify, like, yeah, what if it is a spouse or kid or, or these kinds of things? But, but it could also be in friendship type relationships. Like, what do we do with, with the boundaries we need to set up there? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the first thing I would say about that is uh, we all have some level of unhealth emotionally or spiritually because mm -hmm. we're growing, we're learning. And so to start with the assumption, this isn't just a them problem. If, they're, if they would fix their life, my life would be better. That's a risky road to go down because now you've made someone else responsible for you and that, that rarely goes well. I also think that, um, uh, that the tendency is we want to control someone else's behavior, especially when they're doing things that are, are costing us a lot or, or causing us pain. And uh, I, I don't think that it's helpful to try to control someone. When someone tries to control you, you don't like it. Why would you think someone else would like it? So I, I think we should think about that. And then uh, one of the stories I go back to in scripture has to do with, uh, with Jesus and Judas. And uh, how many here would agree that Judas was an emotionally and spiritually unhealthy person? Let's, yeah, there's not nearly enough hands. <laughs> You're making me anxious. Uh, uh, so Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. He didn't try to control his actions. He actually told him, go do what you're going to do. And, but he also acknowledged the truth of what was going on. So when Judas comes up in the garden and betrays him, identifies him to the mob that is now going to arrest Jesus as to who Jesus is by giving him a kiss, Jesus actually says, are you betraying me with the kiss? There's a kind of honesty that Jesus is able to implore without becoming overly defensive or trying to control. And I think that there's, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of wisdom in how Jesus managed that. That's good. Yeah, and I would just encourage everybody to, um, there, there's a ton of great questions in the queue. And so if, if there's any ones that you would like for us to be able to ask, uh, you know, I don't know how often we're going to be able to just throw you up here and ask you anything. So I would encourage you to, to upvote any of those and submit your questions uh, even as we're going and as you're listening. Um, somebody writes in, how do I stay positive when I'm with a negative and complaining person? I'm imagining on a regular basis. Mm. It's hard. I, I think, once again, you can't control that person. I think there's two things you can do. Uh, you can try to find places that are more positive for you and spend some time there, invest that time. I think that's a really healthy thing to do. You can also open a conversation, and I've done this with people. Uh, it's an are you aware question. Are you aware of uh, that your responses are often quite negative? And are you aware of the kind of in, impact that has on people who are around you? And often people are not aware. Sometimes they are and they're stuck, which is another uh, issue for them. But I, I think you have to, to name it. But um, my, my goal in something like that is always not just to call a person out on something, but to call them up to something. And so encourage maybe um, 
uh, them finding a way to deal with the things that are so frustrating to them that this is kind of their, their MO, the way they operate in life. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna say this is my personal favorite question I've seen come in in either of the services. Wow. It says this, this is the first time I've been to church and I don't know if this is my last hope or not. Hmm. How do I know that this isn't just another hobby versus a lifestyle? Uh, I guess my warning would be is it could be a hobby. Lots of people make it that. Um, they show up in rooms like this and they hope that that hobby will uh, change God's view of them or maybe make things better in their life. And there's no way, I can't tell by looking at you if this is real or this is a hobby to you. And, and a lot of people get very vexed about that. They want the hobby people out. <laughs> and uh, this is what I've discovered is that uh, people who take it as a hobby don't have to stay there. Like, it can become very real. And so uh, I think it, it is more like a hobby if you feel like I'm just checking boxes. I went to Sunday, I, I prayed a prayer, I listened to a message, I, I, I checked the boxes, so now I'm done. That feels a lot like a hobby to me. But when we're in a place like this, to actually open our heart and give God permission to deal with something, pray, pray a risky and bold prayer. Uh, just, God, um, I'm giving you permission. What do you want to deal with in my life? You'd be surprised how seriously he takes those prayers and what he can do with them, so. I just even want to ask a follow-up on that is like, how, how do you find hope in Jesus? Well, I have to acknowledge that there's not a lot of uh, automatic hope resources left in our world. Uh, most people are, are, they've all become doomsday uh, prophets. They're telling us how bad things are going to get. And, and we're seeing increased levels of anxiety uh, at every age level. And uh, it, it's hard to imagine that there could be hope that's sustainable. And a lot of people feel like, well, you know, religion is, is just a crutch and people lean on it. You know? Well, when, when you can't walk, a crutch is very useful. And uh, I think that to, to invite God in, something begins to happen and it's not something that we are doing for ourselves it's something he starts doing because we're, we're presenting ourselves to him we're making ourselves available and what we notice is things start changing internally and i wish it was you know instant and and you could walk out a completely different person everything in scripture seems to indicate that that is a a season of growth uh, paul would talk about it like this it's like fruit that grows in an orchard and so uh, you see, you see the, the, the flowering and then it becomes something more and more until it's, it's fully mature. I think it's like that. And so what I would tell, the other thing I would tell you is that uh, uh, scripture tells us that hope does not make us ashamed. And some of us are afraid to hope because we'll feel like a fool if something doesn't work out. And uh, don't, don't let the fear of something not working rob you of hope because hope is an amazing resource when you're going through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, how about for somebody who's just feeling totally numb? Like they, they, don't, they don't really feel any of the emotions anymore. Uh, what, what would you say to a person who's in that place and space right now? Yeah, um, so th the real danger of being there is that uh, because you don't feel anything, you make a set of assumptions about your own value, and you can't imagine anything being different in your life than it is right now. And as soon as people cross that bridge, um, it's hard to get back. And sometimes people exercise options that they can't go back. Back to the Judas incident, like he ended his life. Uh, we have a great restoration and reconciliation story with Peter after he denied Jesus. I wish for all the world we could have had a story like that with Judas. And I think some people just tell themselves, I, it doesn't work for me. And, and what I can tell you is if, if you're completely numb, I definitely recommend a, a counselor. And then you're going to have to reintroduce yourself to some things in life that make you feel alive. Because uh, chances are you've eliminated some of those things because other people uh, didn't participate in it with you that you wanted to or or somehow you've, you've told yourself you're not allowed that, but yeah. 
Yeah, I think God made us emotional beings. He, he, did. he didn't make us to stay in a place of numbness. Like he, he desires freedom for everyone of his creation. And so I think um, whether you've you know, felt differently in the past or it's been numb for as long as you can remember, mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize God desires to take us out of the pit. Yeah. And I mean, we just, we just sang a song, you love me when I'm up, you love me when I'm down. Like his love is the thing that can pull us out of that place and space and sure. open up a whole different world to us. And, it, and it's hard when you're there and you can't feel it and you feel like you've done everything. Um, but there is hope and there his is. name is Jesus. There is. Um, how do you fight anxiety when you feel like it affects your everyday life? And, and even further, what's God's point of view on antidepressants as some churches or Christians condemn the use, use of such? Like, wh what do I do if I'm really struggling with anxiety and can I or should I take medications? Um, people have no idea how many people struggle with anxiety and how well they hide it. Uh, just the, um, there's people sitting here looking very normal and if we were to peel back uh, the veil of, of your emotions, what we would find out is your being here today is actually nothing short of a miracle. And, and that's the only way I can describe it because it would be so easy to give in to anxiety and not, not go out, not show up, not do any of those things. So I do think that um, uh, the way forward, you know, that some people think that uh, scripture uh, marks us down for being anxious. Uh, scripture is constant and consistent, and God has always said this. He tells us not to be afraid as a, as a command, not as a command, but as an encouragement. You don't have to be afraid. There's another option that I want to provide you. And then I also think that in our world, the sense of risk, a lot of us are risk averse. We, we don't like doing things that we're not used to or comfortable with. And because that feels a little anxious, uh, uh, we, we put ourselves in the same category as, as people who struggle with deep-seated and long-acting anxiety. And I think that one of the benefits of a life of faith is that it orients us towards how to, to move forward in challenges that we might not be able to control the outcome of or we might not be able to have um, a, a solution to on the front end. And, and regarding, uh, so counseling I think is helpful. And then antidepressants, um, I wish people who are not medically trained would not weigh in on medical issues. Um, I, I never walk into a hospital and give anyone medical advice. I'm not qualified. You'll, you'll never hear me go in and say, well, I don't think you need that surgery. I'm, I, that's not my job. My job is to pray. I had one surgeon offer me to be in the operating room while the surgery was happening, standing in the background praying for the team. That's my job. <laughs> the other stuff is not my job. And when it comes to antidepressants, there's a lot of uninformed conversation that happens because they don't understand uh, uh, how a medication works or why it might be necessary. And I also have to say that there are times when we can use medications not just to help us get through a season and learn something from it, but sometimes we can use medications to keep from doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that's a particularly healthy thing, but um, pastors and politicians probably ought to stay away from conversations about medications. Seems pretty wise, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all right, is it emotionally healthy for somebody to be a Buffalo Bills fan <laughs> if they just keep, you know, emotionally abusing you year after year, getting your hopes up, saying this is the year, and then just crushing it. What would you say to a Buffalo Bills fan who just is at the end of their rope? Uh, see a counselor. <laughs> 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 My wife divorced the Bills a few years oh, ago. Oh, no. She did. Uh, and she announced it. Uh, she <laughs> told me she was divorcing the Bills, and, and I was confused by the concept. And she said, no. She says, uh, they promise to do better every year. Uh, they never do. And oh, so no. I'm enabling their behavior. So, so she said, I'm going to pick another team. And she did. And that team won the Super Bowl. Oh. <laughs> 
and, and I don't know what that feeling is like. <laughs> and may never, so yeah. So my wife has actually liked the Buffalo Bills since she was four years old. Mm. And she said, hey, this is a sign testament to my character. Like I am loyal. I, am, I, like I was that. like, yeah, no, that's that's a great point. And so I put a ring on it. And you know, <laughs> um, it's really the only question I had. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if she's that loyal to you too, you're, you're right. You're that golden. Sounds, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back to a more serious. That question actually wasn't on there. The Lord gave that to me, oh, so I just yeah. felt like I needed to press it's, into that. You it's know, amazing sometimes. what God says when we're not paying attention. Right. There. Right. <laughs> Um, okay, a more serious one is, what resources does Calvary offer those of us who need support emotionally? Yeah, this is actually a part of our benevolence ministries. We understand completely when someone can't pay the gas bill and they're gonna lose heat in the house and electric or um, you know, all, the, all of those things. Uh, sometimes what a person needs is uh, access to some, some good counseling and they can't afford it. They just don't have the resources. And so we actually have someone who's uh, part of our church and provides counseling, they're a trained counselor, and uh, people can set up appointments for that. And the church, if you need help uh, financially, uh, the church actually helps uh, underwrite the cost uh, part, or if necessary, all of the cost of that counseling. And then um, that, that's also not just true of, of the person who's in our church, um, uh, their schedule can be maxed out, and so we would also uh, help underwrite some of the cost of counseling uh, to someone else. Yeah, yeah and, the, and a couple other things to be aware of too is like our pastoral team, it, we're not trained counselors, but we are uh, trained in loving and caring. And so that is different and distinguished from professional counseling, but we are also not of the mindset that we're just like outsourcing all of that. Like we, right. uh, us and our whole team is available to support our church. Like that is why we're here is to help uh, in, in all facets of a human's life. Like it doesn't just have to be, I've got a question about the Bible, can we meet? Sure. Um, uh, you know, exactly. I know. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's key. And the other thing I would also highlight too, is we have compiled a list of uh, professional counselors. Mm -hmm. And so we have somebody who, like you said, is kind of more in-house and helps here. Um, but we have a, a list and even um, here's kind of their areas of expertise and things. And we've honestly compiled that list over years and years. And it's it's been based off other people in our church who have said, hey, I've gone to this person, they've really helped me. And uh, so if that's something that you're interested in and getting access to, uh, our slides team is going to put my email up on uh, the screen there, and uh, and it's also available at, at our website at rcalvary.org. You can send me a note, and I can send that over to you, and, and we'll help you um, however we can, Great. for sure. Um, okay, what are some good biblical guidelines to navigate being hurt in a church? I'm finding uh, biblical application isn't always delivered or received well. So uh, what, are, what are some good guidelines to being able to navigate that hurt that they're feeling? Um, that's a really good question. I, I do think uh, we've, we've had kind of uh, uh, reoccurring stories of people who have experienced hurt in religious environments. And by the way, that's a very, those are very deep hurts. Uh, because there's a kind of trust and dependence that you have uh, on spiritual environments and spiritual leaders. And when that goes south, like it gets past a lot of defenses that we've created for ourselves. Um, I do think that um, there's, a, there's a tendency in our culture, I don't know if this is true everywhere, there's a tendency in our culture to want to have instant friendships and, uh, and feel the depth of, of that. And I would caution, uh, you know, it takes time to build a really good friend. Uh, I have an accountability partner that I've had uh, breakfast with once a week uh, for 20 years. And uh, when we started out, the level of our conversation isn't where it is right now. And so over time, uh, we have risked a little more in conversation. We've talked to each other, we've opened up. And there's virtually nothing that I would not talk to this person about now, or he to me. And we've been a great resource for each other, but that took, that took time. It didn't take us 20 years uh, to develop a good relationship, but it did take us 20 years to get where we are now. And I think just being willing to take that time 
And then when you have concerns, uh, this is what I would recommend to anybody in any church. When you have concerns, you can talk to leadership about it. And if leadership responds in an unhealthy way, there's your answer, right? It, no one should feel like that they have to prove to God their loyalty by being under unhealthy, uh, abusive leadership. That, that's not good. And then once again, uh, building, trusting that relationships can start and can, can form. Because here's the thing, <laughs> we often want God to take the pain out of our life and we don't realize that that has to be replaced with something else. And so we don't bring good things into our life because we don't think we can handle them or we're not even interested in them. And one of the great mistakes that people make and one of the reasons people are more likely to sin greatly is because they deny themselves some healthy things that are, that are enjoyable in life. And if you're not allowing the good things in your life, it's not going to go well for you. I don't know how long it'll take, but I know what, where it will go. And so just uh, trying to open up, uh, this is the other thing I, I used to tell my children, and you might judge me for this, but it's, it's where we were. Uh, I would tell them, uh, we don't ever completely open the door to somebody we don't know. Right? If someone comes to the house and, and they knock on the door, they don't just get an open door. Look out the window. If you don't know who they are, just go someplace else in the house. Uh, but sometimes in life, what we do is we open the door a little bit and we see how that goes before we open the door more. And there's a misappropriation of spiritual teaching that just says you have to open the door all the way, right away, if you're going to have a good relationships uh, in life. And that, that's unwise. Take it incrementally. Open the door a little, see how it goes. If it's going good, open a little more. If it's not going good, close the door. That's good. Um, I'm going to invite the worship team back out, but I would like uh, to end on this question. I do just want to say thank you to everybody for submitting awesome questions. There's, okay. there's still this queue of like 20 awesome questions, and maybe there's a way we can get to them in some other means or fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I, I did just want to ask this, like, what has been some of the hardest and least healthy emotional seasons you have had to walk through? Hmm. And how did you walk through that? How did you get through that? Like, yeah, to tell us, tell us about when you were in more of a harder space emotionally. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you that uh, being a, a pastor of a church kind of exempts you from that. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, two of the more difficult things I've ever walked through in my life, uh, one of them was uh, by my own actions, and the other one had to do with others' actions. The first one, I'd gotten to a, a place in my life where um, I didn't want to take responsibility for things. I didn't want to do the work that I was responsible for. And anytime I felt like there was any resistance to something, I would just back away. And, uh, and I would cover it up with language that sounded spiritual. I'm, I'm just turning that over to God. You know, just, I'm, I'm letting go and I'm letting God. And, and sometimes that language is just a cop out. We were driving in the car one day and the kids had fallen asleep in the back seat and, and my wife, um, uh, she said, is this a good time to talk? And for all the guys in the room, that's code. <laughs> done, just, done, done. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get serious real fast. And she named it. She called it for what it was. And uh, she said, I don't have any answers for you. Uh, she says, but I know it's not good for you. It's not good for our relationship. It's not good for your relationship with the kids. It's not good for your relationship in ministry. And she said, so I, I don't know what to tell you other than it's something I've noticed and maybe you should deal with that. And uh, of course I knew it was true. And uh, I, I did some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life for two years. I deconstructed my life and I tried to build a healthier version of it. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm here today. Uh, I don't know where that other path would have gone, but I'm grateful I never had to find out. And uh, so that, that was a big deal. Um, 
The, the second thing actually had to do, and, and I always have to reference something like this, so because people start putting on their Sherlock Holmes hats and try to figure out who somebody is, and, and it has nothing to do with this church. But uh, I had uh, two very close friends uh, that betrayed me deeply. Uh, the options they exercised regarding me were intensely painful. And they said things that weren't true. Um, they allowed things to be said that weren't true. And it caused me some of the greatest pain uh, I've ever experienced in my life. I couldn't sleep. Um, I, I was uh, struggling with uh, deep levels of anxiety. Um, it, was, it was absolutely brutal. And one of the things about that and people don't tell you this. It's bad enough that the betrayal hurt you, but that's not some of the worst of it. Because this thought comes into your head. I can't tell who I can trust. And the minute that thought comes in your head, you start isolating yourself from the people who can actually be helpful to you. And so once again, a counseling was a key part of that. And uh, it took me quite a while to get through it. And by God's grace, um, I did. But what I can tell you is that whether it's actions caused or inactions by you or by someone else, that it is not God's intention that you spend the rest of your life laying on the ground bleeding out. That God really does have a life that if you could see it, not only would you want it, you'd run towards it. And so it just, sometimes we feel stuck and it's going to take some work, but I promise you it's worth it. Yep. It is. Amen. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing this morning. Can we all thank Pastor Bob uh, for his, for your wisdom, for your insights, your vulnerability, all of it. Um, I, I would love uh, for you to pray for all of us as a church that we could be emotionally healthy. We could be uh, running into the arms of our heavenly father. And so, yeah, if you'd pray for us, I'd appreciate sure. that. Um, um, father, um, there's a part of our hearts that can get trampled on. Uh, it can happen really early in life, but I wish I could say that's the only time. Uh, some of us have multiple stories to tell. And for some of us, we're hanging on by, <clears throat> by a thread. <clears throat> it's hard to, it's hard to imagine that anything could be different than it is right now. And coming to my mind right now is the person who's sending a question and it's their first time and, and they're wondering, can you find hope that's real? And, and I would ask that you would help all of us find that today. All of us. That um, it might not always look like a finished picture of something we can run towards, but it can be a step that we can take today that moves us in the direction that you would have for us. And I just ask uh, that as we gather together, that you would use our times uh, to build something healthy and holy in our hearts, because our world is so in need of that. Um, lots of people are struggling. We're willing to acknowledge that, and we're looking to you to help us with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Joel, stand with me this morning. Thanks.